Hi guys and welcome to another video. Today we'll have a very quick look under the bonnet and I'll give you guys an overview of everything we can see. We'll remove the engine cover too and have a look underneath it. As the title suggests, this is going to be a relatively simple look uh, aimed at people with my low level of technical knowledge. This is information I picked up through various other videos and forums and so I thought I would put it all together in this one video. This material under the bonnet serves as a fire blanket. Starting from the upper left side, this is the left hand hood gas strut. This little red flap gives you access to your battery's positive terminal. You can remove this plastic cover with removal of these three 10 mm bolts. There is a brake fluid tank underneath this cover. This is the wiper fluid reservoir. This is the battery's negative terminal. This is the air filter box, also known as the intake muffler. It contains the paper air filter and also some sound absorption foam. This foam can be deleted. Once these clamps are released, the intake muffler can simply be pulled up as it sits on three grommets. This is the intake pipe with built-in resonator, which diverts the air from the intake muffler into the turbo. On this pipe, we see our mass airflow sensor. This sensor measures how much air is getting sucked in and reports it to the ECU so it can add the correct amount of fuel to keep the correct air fuel ratio needed for a particular demand on the engine at the time. The mass airflow sensor can be cleaned with special quick drying cleaners. If the airflow is not measured correctly, you could have too much or too little fuel. So the engine could exhibit things like hesitation, bad idle, stalling, difficulty starting, loss of power or poor fuel economy. This is the turbocharger. The B58 uses a single twin scroll turbo larger than that on the M135i, resulting in around 20% higher boost pressure. We can also see the downpipe with our catalytic converter. There are two oxygen sensors on the downpipe, and these are also used by the ECU for engine condition checking and fuel regulation. This is our steering column. Back to the air intake. The air exits the turbo compressor and enters the charge pipe. So the charge pipe takes the compressed and heated air from the turbo to the intake manifold. The charge pipe is plastic and technically sets a limit how much boost can be obtained before it bursts. Aftermarket charge pipes will very likely be metallic, for example aluminium, which would resist bursting under higher boost, for example 26 psi and above. Most of the aftermarket upgrades will have slightly larger diameter, which can hold more air and has been claimed to increase throttle response. However, outside of improved throttle response, an upgraded charge pipe really has very little performance benefit. There is a mod to add a seventh fuel injector here on the charge pipe itself. This is the engine cover. It is held on by four grommets and its purpose is mostly cosmetic, although it could also dampen noise and provide some minimal protection to engine components. As you can see, the cover leaves access to the oil fill cap. It could potentially also optimize airflow inside the engine bay, but it's unlikely to affect the engine significantly if removed. Let us remove the engine cover. As you can see, it has noise dampening foam material underneath. The engine cover might be contributing to heat retention, however, and it may be beneficial to the engine heat management to remove it. As we can see, the charge pipe connects to the throttle body, which is an extra system that assists the valvetronic mechanism in operation transitions and is also there for redundancy. The air passes through the throttle body flap into the intake manifold. This is an air-water intercooler, which cools down the compressed air from the turbo before it is used for combustion. This is the cylinder head cover. It covers our six cylinders and their pistons with the cylinders aligned that way towards the back of the car. Therefore, cylinder one is the closest to us and cylinder six is the furthest away. Each cylinder uses two exhaust and two intake valves for a total of 24 valves. This is the TMAP sensor. This sensor provides pressure and temperature data to the ECU at the intercooler and several tuning boxes connect to this sensor. 
This is the manifold air pressure sensor, otherwise known as the boost sensor. And next to it is the charge pipe temperature sensor. Several tuning boxes connect to the boost sensor. Tuning boxes intercept the boost sensor signal and downgrade the reading back to the ECU. This fools the ECU into adding more boost to achieve its target. Here we see the camshaft position sensor and here we see the fuel rail pressure sensor. More advanced tuning boxes also monitor and manipulate signals from these sensors as well. Here we see the ignition coils. There are of course six of them and they connect to the spark plugs. An ignition coil transforms the battery's voltage to the thousands of volts needed to create an electric spark in the spark plugs to ignite the fuel. Sluggish acceleration and misfires are symptoms of a worn coil. In the back, we can see the high pressure fuel pump which obviously delivers fuel to the six fuel injectors via the fuel rail. I think there is a low pressure fuel pump, fuel filter and fuel level sensor assembly in the fuel tank in the back. To access the fuel pump and the number 5 and number 6 ignition coils and spark plugs, you need to remove the strut brace and surrounding hardware. This rubber seal is the strut brace protector and underneath it is the strut brace. The strut brace is bolted from the left hand to the right hand strut towers and these little circular plastic covers need to be removed to access the bolt securing it. After the strut brace is removed, there are more plastic and foam parts to remove underneath. This makes working on the number 1 to number 4 cylinders a relatively easier task than working on the number 5 and number 6 cylinders. You can see some discoloration of the rubber seals on my car and I was told the seals changed color due to the cleaning products used at the car wash. The oil filter is here and it can be replaced from above this gap. This is the engine oil fill cap but I don't know what this other cap next to it is. The B58 holds about 6.5 liters of engine oil. There is no dipstick to check oil level, there is only an oil level sensor underneath. In terms of the ZF8 transmission, uh, oil or fluid, it, it is serviced from underneath the car as well, I believe. This is the engine control unit or ECU cover. The ECU is also known as the Digital Motor Electronics or DME. Until relatively recently, the ECU was protected in such a way that tuning companies could not load custom tunes. This made tuning boxes, which essentially fool the ECU by reporting false readings from sensors, very popular. Some tuning companies offered removal of the ECU and hacking into it on a bench. However, recently tuning companies have been able to crack the ECU protection and are now able to load directly onto the ECU their custom tunes. Here we see our coolant reservoirs or coolant expansion tanks. This larger one is linked with the engine radiator or engine heat exchanger. For example, its coolant goes to the oil to water heat exchanger next to the oil filter assembly. The smaller coolant expansion tank or reservoir holds the coolant for the intercooler and turbo radiator heat exchanger. Both of these tanks have a maximum and minimum coolant level indicator and hold a 50-50 mix of water and coolant. Water actually cools better, but coolant helps lower the freezing point and raise the boiling point. Coolant also helps prevent corrosion. Lack of coolant or improper mixture will obviously result in engine overheating issues. Here we see the fan and just in front of it we have our two radiators or heat exchangers. They are under this metallic cover structure here. The one in the back closest to the fan is the engine radiator and the one on the front is the intercooler radiator. The engine radiator will be at higher temperatures than the intercooler radiator, although as you modify the engine and increase boost, the temperature in the charge pipe and intercooler will also rise. This is why many companies, for example Wagner and CSF, offer upgraded intercooler radiators or heat exchangers. Increased heat robs power in several ways. The main way being that hotter air is less dense and results in less oxygen, which is key for power. With the hotter air, the risk of knock is also increased. So to counter this, the ECU will introduce its safety protocols to reduce power until the air is cool again. Just to recap, this engine is fitted with a water-to-air charge cooling system. It is a separate system from the engine coolant and is why there are two filler caps in the engine bay. It is extremely effective at cooling this engine when under load 
with the vehicle in motion and can handle large power increases easily. It is however very susceptible to heat soak when stationary. As you can see the charge cooler radiator is not equipped with its own cooling fan. Without air flow across of it, the charge coolant increases in temperature rapidly while the vehicle is idling or moving at low speeds. Intake temperatures will quickly increase and while the coolant remains too hot, engine power will be reduced until temperatures return to normal without any notification to the driver. This is not a fault and will happen on a stock or tuned vehicle. Warmer weather will naturally exacerbate this. This is the auxiliary water pump which activates to improve intercooler function. Here we see the V-belt or serpentine belt which drives the alternator, the auxiliary water pump and the air conditioned compressor. This is the alternator. The alternator is an electric generator used to charge the battery and to power the electrical system when its engine is running. Here are the bonnet latches, the vanos, the upper and lower timing chains and the oil pump chain are now on the rear of the engine. Vanos is BMW's terminology for variable valve timing. The Vanos system has been a common problem and maintenance item, principally due to Vanos solenoids. Obviously working on the timing chains is also now more complicated due to the fact they're on the back of the engine. Down here is our oil cooler heat exchanger. That's it guys, I hope you learned something and if I got something wrong, please let me know in the comments below. Thank you very much for watching.